Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Chad Normandon. Chad earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Sherbrooke before completing his master's there as well. Chad was doing medicinal chemistry research there in the group of Professor Eric Mersol until 2021, when he transitioned to the group of Professor Louis Berriel at the University of Ottawa, where he's currently completing his PhD. And from there, I'll let you get started, Chad. Thank you very much for coming on today. Thanks, Matt, for the introduction and for giving me an opportunity to share my research on your platform. Today, I'm going to present the two different syntheses of tomatzin that we have achieved in our lab. Firstly, tomatzin is a glycoalkaloid of the Solanaceae family. It is isolated after the acidic hydrolysis of the naturally occurring tomatzin, which bears four sugar units at the C3 position. It is isolated from nightshade plants, such as the tomato plant, in the fruit, root, and leaves at even concentrations. Structurally speaking, it is an exocyclic steroid bearing 12 stereo centers and a quite unusual spiral amino ketal moiety. This molecule has not been previously synthesized and is of low natural abundance. Tomatzin can be bought commercially but will set you back about $1,500 to $2,000 per gram, with an average purity ranging from 80 to 85%. We were motivated to synthesize this compound due to its newly found antibiotic properties against Staphylococcus aureus bacteria. Staphylococcus aureus is a bacterium that lives inside the nasal cavity and on the surface of the skin of about 30% of the world population. Most of the time it does not cause a problem, but when you do have a weakened immune system, this so-called opportunistic bacterium takes advantage of it to proliferate and cause an infection. In most severe cases, these infections can be fatal. Staphylococcus aureus is particularly problematic as it is responsible for several persistent and difficult to treat infections due to its camouflage tactics which I'm going to explain in a second, and resistance to multiple clinically available antibiotics. In addition, people with cystic fibrosis are particularly sensitive to it. Staph infections, once active, are virulent infections that are difficult to get rid of. Treatment with aminoglycoside antibiotics, such as gentamicin, is going to create persistent mutations called small colony variants, which by themselves are still viable under the aminoglycoside treatment. This is a reversible process, such as once the antibiotic treatment is stopped, the bacteria returns back to its wild-type strain, which is again virulent and active. Small alkaline variants are one of the many mechanisms the bacteria use to survive, making it difficult to get rid of the infection permanently. The small alkaline variants, or SCVs, are characterized by biofilm production, which are the cause of antibiotic persistence and immunity to aminoglycosides. These SCV infections can lead to long-term complications in cystic fibrosis patients, and in the worst case, lead to pneumonia and death. We have identified that tomatzin is a potent agent that can inhibit the formation of these small colony variants, and here's how. Shown here are some time kill experiments showing the viability of wild type Staphylococcus aureus strains in presence of tomatzin and various antibiotics. At the top left, we can observe that versus control, high concentrations of tomatzin by itself do not have an effect on the wild type strain bacteria viability compared to other antibiotics, such as erythromycin and ciprofloxacin. Now if we look at the top right, if we expose staph bacteria to gentamicin, the multiplication is somewhat controlled but comes back to baseline after 24 hours. Now, when staph is exposed to a combination of gentamicin and tamatzin, the bacteria population is drastically lowered and remains low even after 24 hours. In other experiments shown at the bottom, multiple strains of the bacteria are exposed to varying concentration of tamatzin, in micrograms per milliliter. We can see that it cannot control the viability of the wild type strains shown in blue, but by itself can very much kill the small colony variants shown in red, even at low concentrations. From these experiments, we can conclude that tomatzin is effective against wild type Staphylococcus aureus strains when used in synergy with aminoglycosides and by itself highly active against small colony variants, making it a potent agent in the treatment of multi resistant staph infections. From 2012 to 2014, our laboratory initially probed the structure activity relationship, or SAR, of tomatzin by making about 55 derivatives, with modifications mostly made around the A and F rings. The best derivatives were able to bring the standalone minimum inhibitory concentration, or MIC, eightfold against the wild type strain. Potentiation of tomatzin with aminoglycosides remained the same, while all the derivatives were less effective against the small colony variants. 
This study outlined the need for more raw material since SAR studies are still ongoing in our lab to this day with over 400 derivatives made, which remains unpublished. In 2018, it was discovered that ATP synthase is the target of tomatazine, effectively targeting ATP production in staph. It is important to note that tomatazine has next to no activity against the human ATP synthase, therefore poses no toxicity in that regard. A crystal structure of this protein with tomatazine has yet to be obtained. This work is still very much in progress and would help identify key interactions with this target for further SAR studies. Biosynthetically speaking, tomatazine is synthesized from phytocholesterol, which is transformed through a series of game enzymes, which is a short for glycoalkaloid metabolism. Phytocholesterol is synthesized through the mevalonate pathway and built from multiple acetyl-CoA units. Phytocholesterol is initially oxidized twice at the C22 and C26 to give dihydroxycholesterol, which again after double oxidation gives the hemiketone rate. Oxidation to the aldehyde and transamination using ammonia gives the primary amine 26 aminofurostanol which after formal loss of water from the hemiketal and ring closing of the amine gives the spiroaminoketal of the natural product. Further reduction of the C5-C6 double bond yields our natural product. Glycosyl transferase enzymes are responsible for glycosidation that lead to the natural product tomatsin. The biosynthetic spiroaminoketalization event highlighted in blue gave us inspiration and was used to construct the natural product, which I will show a little later. We first highlighted a few guidelines for synthesis. The first and very important one was to develop a semi-synthesis, as we wanted to avoid the construction of the complete steroid backbone, which would bring overall efficiency down. It was important to find a suitable starting material that already contained a steroid backbone to achieve a gram scale synthesis. In this manner, we identified the dinorcholanic lactone shown here as a decent starting point, as it already contained five of the six carbocycles needed with malleable moieties at both ends of the molecule. We then would only have to build the F ring from this molecule. This molecule was traced back to digenin, which is collected on the industrial scale from the acidic hydrolysis of fenugreek and yam. This material was sourced and obtained at a cost of only 30 cents per gram. The commercial product Dagenin bears a methyl group at the C25 position with the R configuration, and our target contains a S methyl at the C25 position. It would be impossible to then just do a simple ring opening, nitrogen substitution, and ring closing sequence to build a natural product, which is why we needed to quote unquote cut Dagenin's F ring into the lactone shown and then graft an asymmetric synthon containing the right stereocenter. Now armed with a plan that respects these three guidelines highlighted in green, let's jump into the retrosynthetic analysis. In a biomimetic manner, we opted to generate the spiroamino ketal moiety as one of the last steps. Thus, following deprotection at C3, breaking the C end bond led us back to a hemiketal intermediate, bearing a terminal amine, very similar to the biological intermediate. We intended to introduce the F ring fragment through an organometallic addition of an asymmetric synthon bearing a protected oxygen as generating an organometallic region from a nitrogen containing molecule is usually quite difficult. Following up this alkylation would be a deprotection and nitrogen substitution of the demform adduct. This adduct was traced back to the C3 protected lactone seen earlier, generated in three steps from diagenin, and a 5-carbon asymmetric synthon bearing a primary halide, which could be made from the THP alkene shown on the right. We first focus on generating the steroid fragment. Firstly, diagenin was hydrogenated using Perlman's gallus under 40 psi of hydrogen overnight. The syn hydrogenation led to a single alpha C5 hydrogenation product, as the top of the steroid is quite sterically hindered. Here's a picture of the PAR hydrogenation apparatus used for this transformation. This reaction could be scaled up to 50 grams using a 1 liter thick walled steel cylinder. Next, the F ring of diagenin is oxidatively cleaved through an abnormal Bayer Villiger oxidation. The spiral ketal moiety of the reduced product, named tegogenin, can be imagined as this very thermodynamically unfavored ketodiol form of a ketal shown at the top. This ketone can then be oxidized using per acetic acid and presence of catalytic amounts of iodine and sulfuric acid. Using these conditions, the less substituted side of the ketone, shown in pink, migrates versus the more substituted alkyl fragment shown in blue. The mechanism of this transformation hasn't been detailed in the literature so far. Following this oxidation, the crude ester is saponified using potassium hydroxide and ethanol overnight at room temperature. 
After coming back the next morning, the pH of the solution is neutralized using one molar hydrochloric acid to regenerate the carboxylic acid, which then instantly lactonizes to give the desired lactone, which is collected by filtration. The crude lactone is then dried under an infrared lamp to drive out all the moisture and recrystallize from ethyl acetate to yield an off-yellow solid in 80%. This lactone is then protected at the C3 position as its third butyl diphenylsilyl ether in 96%. A total of 27 grams of this lactone were produced. We then engaged this lactone in organometallic addition reaction tests using, at first, granule regions. Following extensive optimization, no usable amounts of the product could be isolated using multiple homemade or commercial granule regions in multiple solvent and temperature settings. What we mainly observed was double addition product. We proposed that the single addition product could be reopened to form the ketone shown on the right, which could then engage in a second addition reaction. The use of magnesium organometallic reagent was then discarded. We then turned our attention to lithium halogen exchange. In order to test the reaction, we decided to generate the desired alkyl lithium that would be required in a natural product, but in racemic form. This short synthesis began from racemic butanol, which was protected as its THP ether using 3,4-dihydropyran and catalytic amounts of paratoluene sulfionic acid to give the product a 95% yield. The THP moiety was chosen for its resistance to strong bases, the base required for methyl acid exchange, and ease of the protection. This alkene was then engaged in hydroboration using 9-BBN, followed by standard oxidative hydrogen peroxide sodium hydroxide cleavage, at room temperature to give the corresponding primary alcohol in 85%. This alcohol was then engaged in an apple reaction to generate the desired primary alkyl iodide in 90%. We then initially probed the organometallic addition of the synthon to the lactone by generating the corresponding alkyl lithium shown in the mechanism here. First, the alkyl iodide reacts with a first equivalent of terbutyl lithium through a reversible lithium halogen exchange to generate the desired alkyl lithium and third butyl iodide. A second equivalent of tibuli is then used to push the equilibrium towards the product by reacting with third butyl iodide to generate isobutane, isobutylene, and lithium iodide, which crashes out of solution. The lactone is then added by cannulation to this reagent. The initial reactions proved successful and gave moderate yields of the product using diethyl ether at minus 78. In entry number two, Bringing up the mixture to zero bumped up the yield from 45 to 58%. The yield, however, went down to 39% when this reaction was stirred at longer time at lower temperature. However, overall, the yield remained low during these test reactions on 15 mg scale. What helped us for this reaction was the addition of pentane to the mixture, which favorized the displacement of the equilibrium to the right by further precipitating a lithium iodide. We were able to bring up the yields up to 66%, by first lowering the reaction time to 5 minutes at minus 78 and bringing the test scale to 500 milligrams, as these reactions generally don't work on super small scales. We were satisfied with these results and then moved on to the synthesis of the required asymmetric alkyl iodide. The synthesis started from a Pulsar Chiral Auxiliary, available commercially at $5 per gram, which was treated with sodium hydride and toluene, followed by crotonoyl chloride to give the product shown. This product was obtaining 96% yield after recrystallizing from methanol. Deprotonation at the gamma carbon followed by treatment with methyl iodide generated the asymmetric alpha methylated product in 87% yield with a 50 to 1 DR, again after recrystallization from methanol. It is worth noting that for this transformation, the more common and cheaper Evans chiral auxiliary offered poor diastereoselectivity with a reported DR of only 3 to 1. The alkylated product was then treated with lithium aluminum hydride and generated the corresponding alcohol, which was rather volatile. This alcohol was not isolated and was protected directly as its THP ether in 93% yield over two steps. Hydroboration and apyl reaction using the previously used conditions yielded the asymmetric alkyl iodide in 86 and 91% yield, respectively. A few transformations for this sequence posed the challenge when scaled up. For the alkylation reaction, HMPA and methyl iodide, which are both carcinogenic agents, had to be distilled from calcium hydride. Also, the desired alkyl iodide was very unstable and had to be synthesized in the dark and used directly after its purification, as it decomposed even when stored under argon in the freezer. We then employed the previously used conditions to join the two fragments. 
the adduct could be generated in 82% yield on a 5 gram scale. Also counting other rounds of this reaction, a total of 8.8 .8 grams of this adduct was generated. Following our retrosynthetic route, it was now time to deprotect the THP ether with goals of substituting the primary alcohol and to introduce the required nitrogen atom, which we envisioned to do through Mitsunobi reaction. However, no matter how mild the conditions used for the deprotection, we were never able to isolate the primary alcohol. What we observed instead was the spiral ketone product, which we thought was generated by the trapping of this primary alcohol as soon as it was deprotected by the oxonium stemming from the hemiketal moiety. We were able to generate a crystal of this product to confirm its structure. We were stunned to find that the spiral ketalization happened from behind the molecule, placing the S-C25-methyl in an actual position instead of the more thermodynamically preferred equatorial position. Upon further investigation, we concluded that the anomeric effects were responsible for this unexpected result. The four sure confirmations that the spiral ketal could adapt were analyzed for their anomeric effects, and indeed, the confirmation that has two anomeric effects places the methyl in an actual position, as seen at the bottom. We decided to continue ahead with the obtained spiral ketal, now bearing the desired S configuration at the C25 of the steroid. Treatment of the obtained adduct with catalytic amounts of peridium pyrotoluene sulfonate and methanol at zero degrees instantly formed the mixed ketal product reacting with the molecule of methanol, which after warming up to room temperature yielded the spiral ketalization product. Pushing these conditions and heating the mixture to reflux yielded the desilylated C3 alcohol in 87% yield with an over 20 to 1 DR at the C25 carbon. We did not obtain our desired primary alcohol, but we are not stuck at a dead end. After looking up in the literature, we found that multiple protocols have been developed for the ring opening of these spiral stanols since they are synthetically relevant in medicinal chemistry. First, our spiral stanol was protected as its C3 acetate using acetic anhydride in pyridine. When the reaction was complete, the reaction mixture could be crashed out by adding it to ice cold water and filtrating, saving us a workup and yielding the desired acetate in 94% yield. Then, the spiral ketal acetate and lithium bromide were dissolved in a mix of acetyl nitrile DCM before boron trifluoride diethyl etherate was added. Following workup, the crude of the reaction was heated up to 70 degrees Celsius in TMF, followed by addition of sodium azide, to yield the corresponding ring open azide in very high yield. The mechanism is shown here. First, BF3 complexes the F ring oxygen, following by its expulsion with the help of the E ring oxygen. This oxonium intermediate can then engage in two reactions. The faster reaction is the displacement of the complex oxygen by a bromide anion and tautomerization of the oxonium to the enol ether, giving the desired product shown. However, a slower reaction is in competition, effectively where a bromide nucleophile opens the E-ring to neutralize the oxonium, yielding a ketone side product. However, a mixture of these two products can be heated in DMF, which promotes the attack of the ketone back onto the corresponding bromide, following by tautomerization to the more thermodynamically favored enol ether. This sequence of reaction was overall very clean and most of the time did not require purification. The resulting azide was treated with trimethylsilyl iodide, which was generated in situ by the addition of TMS chloride to a solution of sodium iodide in acetonitra. These conditions reduced the azide to an amine and also generated a mildly acidic reaction medium, which was enough to protonate the enol ether and generate an oxonium, which was trapped by the free amine, generating a spiral amino ketal of the natural product in a biomimetic fashion. This reaction generated the expected tomatidine acetate in 67% yield, as well as the C22-C25 diastere isomer 5,6-dihydrosilacidin acetate in 11% yield. These two diastere isomers could be separated by flash chromatography and were hydrolyzed individually using sodium hydroxide and methanol DCM to afford the two products in 95% yield. Crystallization of the two products from methanol afforded crystals suitable for X-ray diffraction, unequivocally confirming their identity. Overall, this work marked the first synthesis of dimetsin with the longest linear sequence of 11 steps and 25% overall yield. We were able to produce over 2.2 grams of this product, which was plenty of feedstock for medicinal chemistry colleagues to use for further derivatization and SAR studies. However, we identify multiple shortcomings in the synthetic methodology that would render a scale-up largely inefficient. 
The reliance on the chiral auxiliary to set the stereo center of the F-ring, the generation of a temperature-sensitive primary alkyl lithium region, and the use of the heavy TBDPS protecting group had to be addressed. To further optimize overall efficiency of a new synthesis, we also set the ambitious objective of avoiding the use of flash chromatography completely, aiming to develop only clean transformations and obtain intermediates from recrystallization, distillations, and silica pads only. In order to help us achieve a more efficient synthesis, we had to revise our strategy. We envisioned to use the last five steps of the synthesis from the spirostanol as it was a high yielding and clean set of transformations. The goal was then to find a new ritual synthetic analysis of the spirostanol. We opted to disconnect the CO bond of the F ring of the spirostanol, bringing us back to a ramified enol ether bearing a terminal alcohol, again protected as THP. This disconnection strategy would enable us to introduce a sidechain synthon containing the required S-C25 methyl to the steroid fragments, effectively leading us back to two fragments of very similar structure seen in the first synthesis. We opted to use the Suzuki Miura reaction to combine the steroid scaffold, functionalized as an enol ether, to an organoborane containing the required 5-carbon sidechain. The Suzuki Miura reaction is known to be a cost efficient way to generate pharmaceutical intermediates and natural products on a large scale. The organoborane would be generated from the same alkene synthon, while the functionalized enol ether could be made from a functional group manipulation of the same lactone. First, the C3 protecting group was adapted to our optimized strategy. The MUM protecting group was chosen owing to its ability to withstand strong basic media, is of low molecular weight, and is also acid labile enabling its removal during the projected acid-promoted spiral ketolization, saving us a deprotection step and enhancing overall efficiency. In such, the C3 alcohol was protected as its mom ether using Unix baits, mom chloride and catalytic amounts of tetrabutyl ammonium iodide and refluxing DCM in 98% yield on a gram scale. We then wanted to transform this lactone into its corresponding enol triflate which are chemical handles that can be used for Suzuki Miura cross-coupling reactions. Sadly, despite extensive efforts, the lactone did not undergo triflation using a wide variety of bases such as the HMDS series as well as LDA, as well as the usual triflation agents like triflate anhydride, bistriflate aniline, and Cummins region. We propose that the strong steric hindrance imparted by the C18 and C21 methyl groups restricted deprotonation at C20. This hypothesis was rationalized when attempts at quenching the supposed enolates with deuterated acetic acid or deuterated methanol yielded no deuterium incorporation at C20. Following this roadblock, we investigated previous work by Bokman and colleagues, which revolve around functionalization of dihydropyrans, or six-member cyclic enol ethers derived from sugar by subjecting them to strong bases, following by treatment with different electrophiles. We aim to do the same using our 5 membered cyclic enol ether or dihydrofuran. This would enable us to prepare the functionalized enol ether derivative containing the required reactive handle for the Suzuki Miura cross coupling. In that extent, the mom derived lactone was reduced with dibol to produce the corresponding hemiacetal in 92% yield in two steps as an inconsequential mixture of the two diastere isomers in a 2 to 1 mix. Screening of different catalytic acidic conditions to eliminate the amyacetal did not cleanly yield the desired enol ether without affecting the mom protecting group. By switching to basic conditions by activation of the amyacetal using methyl sulfur chloride in presence of an excess of triethylamine at high temperatures, afforded the desired enol ether in a modest 65% yield on a 2 gram scale after passage through a short silica pad the first quote-unquote purification step required so far after three steps. Next, we subjected our enol ether to the strong base terbutyl lithium and attempted to quench the deprotonated steroid with various electrophilic halogen sources shown here in hope of producing the halogenated derivative, all of which failed to yield any desired halogenated product. However, treatment of the organolithium intermediate with tributyl chloride cleanly yielded the stenol enol ether which afforded the iodoenol ether after reacting it with molecular iodine and DCM. Although the reaction with tributyl tin chloride and iodine provided a direct route to the iodo derivative, the use of a tin intermediate is chemically inefficient, impedes mass economy, and is dangerous to handle on large scale, 
and also traces of toxic heavy metals would likely be carried to the final product, which was used in in vivo in SAR studies. We circumvented this liability by reacting the deprotonated enol ether with 1,2-diodoethane, a niche electrophilic source of iodine. To our delight, this methodology cleanly afforded the desired iodoenol ether in 91% yield on a 2 gram scale. Now having in hand a route which yielded the first partner of the Suzuki Miyara cross coupling, we turned our attention to desired asymmetric olefin precursor that would be required to generate the organoborane shown here. The required olefin is identical to our first generation synthesis, but we needed to devise a new synthesis as the use of a chiral auxiliary wouldn't be desired on this scale. We identified the commercially available Roche ester series as a potent starting point. Starting from the R Roche ester, we initially protected the primary alcohol as THP using similar conditions seen before, which gave a beautiful blue colored mixture seen here. We followed suit by reducing the ester to the alcohols using LAH. On this scale, we found that quenching the reaction with sodium sulfate decahydrate and directly filtrating the mixture made for a less messy workup than the more usual Roche salt or Pfizer workups. The monoprotected asymmetric diol could be distilled under vacuum in 81% yield over two steps on a 25 gram scale. Subsequent oxidation of the alcohol using a finely ground one-to-one -one mix of pyridine dichromate and silica gel yielded the corresponding aldehyde. We found that the silica gel was critical in this reaction, as it was able to bind to the polymeric chromate byproduct of the reaction, which enabled easy filtration after reaction completion. Without it, the reaction showed poor yields on test scale, usually under 30%. The aldehyde intermediate was filtrated, concentrated, and immediately subjected to a Vedic autophilation by adding it to a premixed cryogenic mixture of phosphorus ilid solution generated by treating triphenyl methyl phosphonium bromide with enbuli. After workup, a short silica pad was able to dispose of the triphenyl phosphine oxide byproducts and the zyre olefin was cleanly obtained in 62% yield after two steps on the 30 gram scale. Here's a picture of the olefination reaction in progress during this 30 gram batch, where the generated ilid is yellow. After individually optimizing all the reactions of the steroid scaffold on a 1 to 2 gram scale, we were able to telescope multiple steps without purification in order to facilitate processing without compromising on either purity or yield. The mom protection, dibol reduction, and amy acid elimination sequence, followed by purification by silica pad, delivered the enol ether initially in 65% yield on the 13 gram scale, and ultimately in 61% yield on a 46 gram scale, over three steps, averaging out to 85% yield per step. During our 13 gram batch, we observed minor decomposition of the substrate by TLC during the dibol reduction, which we attributed to poor temperature control. In consequence, we decided to divide the 46 gram batch in two equal parts and closely monitored the internal temperature during the dibol addition, which was kept below minus 70 C at all times. Here is a few pictures of the process. On the left, we can see the smoky addition of the MOM chloride solution in addition to a substrate during the first step. At the bottom, we can see the two 23 gram batches before the dibol reduction. A thermometer was added one of the next during the addition. I do not have pictures of this setup for the elimination step, but we can see on the right what the silica plug looks like after the workup of the third reaction, which turned the crude from a thick black oil to a clean off-white solid after flushing with the right eluent. Since the next reaction proved to be a safety hazard and in scale, we limited the scale of this transformation not according to the amount of substrate we had, but according to the terbutyl lithium region bottle size and concentration. We did not want to handle large quantities of terbutyl lithium by syringe, which has previously been fatal, such as the accident at UCLA in 2008, involving the mishandling of this region by syringe on large scale. We instead opted to transfer a whole brand new region container of terbutyl lithium to the reaction mixture by cannulation, which was titrated the same day. This limited our exposure to the pyrophore reagent and mitigated a few visits to the lab safety coordinator's office. Here's a picture of the transfer process, where a 100 ml region container is initially sparged with argon gas while connected to a solution of enol ether by cannula. After flooring argon for 10 minutes, the cannula was pushed from the headspace of the t container to the bottom, effectively transferring the strong base to the substrate solution which was cooled to minus 78. The flow rate of this transfer could be controlled by using a glass firestone valve. 
After ensuring the full deprotonation by allowing this mixture to warm up to 0 degrees, the mixture was put back into the dry ice acetone bath and an ethereal solution of diodoethane, which was crystallized the same day, shown here at the bottom, was added again by cannula transfer and this reaction was warmed to room temperature. A thiosulfate workup and short silica pulp delivered the unstable iodosteroid, which needed to be used the same day. Before this iodination reaction was even started, in parallel, another 1 liter 3 neck round bottom flask containing the asymmetric THP alkene in THF was reacted by drop ice addition of a solution of 9 BBN in THF. The 9 BBN solution was previously transferred to the pressure equalized addition funnel by cannulation, again under argon atmosphere. The hydroboration reaction was stirred 3 hours at room temperature before an excess of sodium hydroxide was added slowly. This served two purposes. First, to quench the excess of 9 BBN, and second, to introduce to the reaction mixture the base required for the crush coupling reaction. 1.5 equivalents of the organoborane was generated in this manner, and this was all timed so that the hydroboration and quench sequence would match the time it took to synthesize, work up, and purify the iodoenol ether, which itself took about 2 hours. The freshly synthesized iodosteroid and 20% of the palladium catalyst were then dissolved in a THF water mixture, followed by cannulation of this organoborane solution made on the side. The cross coupling reaction took 5 hours and was worked up concentrated again and passed through a silica pad using a mix of ethyl acetonic hexane as eluent. The experimental manipulations of this iodination cross-coupling sequence took about 20 hours of work in a single day. This yielded 26 gram of the crude adduct, which was then engaged into the acid-mediated THP deprotection, spiroketylization and MOM deprotection sequence using methanolic hydrochloric acid, generated in situ by slowly adding acetyl chloride to the crude mixture dissolve in methanol. Here we can see the progression of the reaction, passing from a slightly soluble cross-coupling adduct on the left to the very insoluble spiroketal product. This multiple step reaction was followed by an NMR, which indicated that the mom deprotection at the C3 was the slower of the three chemical steps. We found that it was most convenient to purify the desired spiroketal intermediate directly from the reaction mixture. Heating methanol to its boiling point fully solubilized the substrate, shown here by this dark red solution, which turned into a beautifully crystallized spiroketal after cooling off at minus 20 degrees Celsius overnight. Simple filtration yielded the spiroketal in 44% yield over 3 steps and 5 chemical transformations from the enol ether, averaging 76% per step. The DR to C25 methyl was around 8.1 to 1, which was much lower than the 20 to 1 we obtained in our first synthesis. We attribute this loss of diastereo selectivity to the synthesis of the asymmetric THP alkene, which involved olefination of the alpha methyl aldehyde using the strong basic conditions of the Wittig olefination. Even though we used an excess of the phosphonium salt during the olefination, we think that the end bullet could have contributed to epimerize the base sensitive aldehyde and erode the enantiopurity of the olefin. The 9 grams of this obtained spiroketal was then engaged in a 5 steps acetylation, Lewis acid mediated ring opening, azide substitution, ring closing, and saponification sequence shown earlier. This yielded us, following again a short silica pad, the desired tomatidine in conjunction with the 5 6 dihydrosalacidine minor product in 76% yield in a 5.9 to 1 ratio. We were able to bring up this ratio by selective crystallization of tomatidine in a 9 to 1 ratio and a 57% overall yield for 5 steps. The crystallization process involved dissolving the mixture of the two products in a mix of DCM and methanol in a crystallizing dish, which itself was placed inside a larger, hermetically closed container containing only methanol. The DCM vapor would then slowly evaporate in the outer methanol layer, giving us a very slow and controlled crystallization process of tomatidin as its methanol co-crystal. After a few days, the container was opened to reveal beautiful crystals of tamatidin. The supernatant was removed using a pasture pipette and the crystals were collected, dried under strong vacuum, to yield over 5 grams of our precious natural product. This effectively concluded the second synthesis of this natural product, which could be delivered in gram scale quantities without column chromatography required. This work has been a culmination of three years of work during my time in the Marshall Group and continues to provide raw material for further SAR studies against Staph aureus. To conclude this talk, I would like to thank Professor Eric Marceau for his guidance and mentorship over the years. 
I would also like to warmly thank Pierre Le Boudreau and my fellow lab mates Irina, Julien, Runjun, and Abder who work on SAR studies with me, as well as Professor Malouin of the biology department. I'd also like to thank all the members of the Marceau lab who are an amazing bunch of scientists. Last but not least, I would want to dedicate this work to my principal investigator, mentor, and friend, Eric Marceau, who sadly passed away in early 2021, a few months before this work was completed. Eric was an amazing mentor and pioneer in the medicinal chemistry field, but more importantly, he was a deeply caring and generous leader that made a profound impact on my life and career. He is missed dearly by his family and his lab family. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Chad for taking us into the world of tomatidine today. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.